The golf teaches our kids all the good things, all the, the right things about life because it teaches etiquette, it teaches how to follow the rules, it teaches time management, and it teaches self-discipline. Despite several obstacles in life, Calvin Peet, aka Mr. Accuracy, broke through and became not only one of the pioneers for black golfers, but also truly one of the top players on tour during his time. Greetings y'all, it's your knock Peter Mata, and today, we're going to talk about Calvin Pete, the best black golfer before Tiger Woods. Born in Detroit, Michigan to Irina and Dennis Pete, Calvin was one of 19, yes I said 19 children. Growing up, Calvin moved around a good bit. He stayed in Detroit, Haiti, Missouri, and Pahokee, Florida. At the age of 12, Calvin fell from a cherry tree and broke his left elbow in three places. While surgeons repaired his fractures, Calvin's elbow joint remained permanently fused so he could never fully straighten his arm. More on this later. At 15, Calvin dropped out of school and for several years he supported himself by selling clothes, watches, jewelry, stereos, and other wares to migrant farm workers all the way from Florida to New York and everywhere in between. It wasn't until he was 23 when Calvin finally picked up a golf club in Rochester, New York in 1966. What attracted me was the challenge of the game because see, he was a little boy and I didn't play basketball, I didn't play baseball, the pitcher throwing the ball that y'all was able to hit it. But here's a ball, here's just sitting here hit me. And, you, and when I first started playing, I couldn't hit it. You know, there's a lot of times I whipped it, you know, and my ego really got to me. Play basketball, and, and it was a challenge that I never experienced before. So that's what attracted me to the game. Then, as Ronald uh, said, you know, uh, you know, after you know, learning how to get the ball off the ground in the air, now to be able to control the ball. So that's what really attracted me to the game. Seemingly finding his calling, Calvin moved back to Florida and carved his life around golf. He took a night job managing apartments in Fort Lauderdale, and with his other time, he played and practiced constantly. He'd even look for driving ranges with floodlights so he could practice during the evenings. After watching Lee Elder, another pioneer for black golfers, battle Jack Nicklaus in a playoff in 1968, Calvin was inspired that he too could make it onto the PGA Tour and play the best. With his newfound goal, Calvin continued to push, and in 1971, he turned professional, hacking it around many different mini-tours and special African-American events for four years, he finally broke through in 1975. That year, he qualified through PJ Tour Q School, and he became the first black golfer not to go through the caddy ranks. For his first three years on tour from 1976 to 1978, he played decently. While he didn't have any victories, in each of those seasons he registered a handful of top 25s, a couple top 10s, and made over $20,000. In 1979, he had his breakout season. He claimed his first PGA Tour win at the Greater Milwaukee Open, and along with that, he registered 9 other top 25s including 6 top 10s, and a 2nd and 3rd place finish. Overall, he made $122,481 that season. And he also qualified for the 1980s Masters, which made him the second black golfer behind Lee Elder to play in the tournament. This season gave a small preview to the wonderful decade of play that was in store for Calvin in the 1980s. After decent winless seasons in 1980 and 1981, Calvin made up for lost time in 1982. That year, he racked up four PGA Tour wins, those being the Greater Milwaukee Open again, the Anheuser-Busch Golf Classic, the BC Open, and the Pensacola Open. Additionally, he won twice on the Japan Tour, and he was also in contention for the US Open at Pebble Beach, where he played with Jack Nicklaus in the final round, and also for the PJ Championship at Southern Hills. He finished tied 10th and 3rd respectively in those events. Overall, he finished tied as a tour leader in wins, and fourth on the money list with his $318,470 in earnings. He just about matched these results in the following years. 
In 1983, Calvin captured two more wins at the Georgia Pacific Atlanta Golf Classic and the Anheuser-Busch Golf Classic for the second time. And he again was in contention at that year's US Open at Oakmont, where he played with the eventual winner Larry Nelson in the final round. And also again, he finished fourth on the money list. All of these great results, along with earning his GED, allowed Calvin to qualify for the United States Ryder Cup team. And with his 2-1-1 record, it helped the US claim victory against Europe. In 1984, Calvin registered a fourth place finish at the PGA Championship and claimed another victory at the Texas Open. Most significantly that year, he beat out Jack Nicklaus for the Varden Trophy, which is given out to the player with the lowest scoring average. This brings us to 1985, when Calvin captured his crowning achievement. With already one win under the belt at the Phoenix Open, Calvin found himself tied for the 54-hole lead at the unofficial fifth major, the then Tournament Players Championship. With clutch play including this putt on the 15th, and this tight iron shot on the Island Green 17th, Calvin was able to stroll down the last and easily finish off the biggest win of his career. At that moment, I felt that I had reached my mountain top. I satisfied myself that I was respected as a champion. I felt that I had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish in golf. I had competed with the best golfers in the world, the strongest field in the world, and I had emerged victorious. Following the win, he again qualified for the U.S. Ryder Cup team, although this time it was in a losing effort. Moving on to 1986, he captured his last two victories on tour at the Moni Tournament of Champions and the USFNG Classic. Calvin continued to play on the PGA Tour until 1993 when he turned 50, and then he played primarily on the Senior Tour until eventually retiring in 2001. Wanting to spread his wisdom to the younger generations, Calvin was a big advocate for the game during his later years. He'd often help the First Tee and other organizations teach kids golf and life lessons. And no matter how bad things may seem to be, you may be down, but you're not out. See, I've been down before too, but I wasn't out. You know that old saying, when the tough gets, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. That's what we got to instill in our children. We wasn't born to be successful. This is something is what you call an acquired part of life. You got to work at success. Success just don't come to you. I don't care what father may have or mother may have, but God bless the one, the child that has his own. You got to get it for yourself, and that's what I gave, gave to my children. Unfortunately, in 2015, we did end up losing this great icon. After battling lung cancer, Calvin Pete passed away at the age of 71. In terms of Calvin Pete's ultimate impact, there's a number of things to mention. First off, let's talk about the injury that was mentioned earlier. Since Calvin couldn't strain his left arm, it meant he couldn't make the traditional golf swing, so he had to develop his own unique approach. Grinding day and night on his game, and with only a small piece of advice about his grip from a pro shop clerk, Calvin did eventually find his own way. With physical limitations, he developed a simple strategy. He couldn't hit it high and he couldn't hit it far, but what he could do is hit it straight. And sticking to that, he found unprecedented and unmatched success off the tee, which of course earned him the nickname Mr. Accuracy. With so many good players on the tour now, it's always good to be able to beat them at at least one phase of the game, so I really take pride in being the number one driver on tour. For 10 straight seasons, from 1981 to 1990, he led the tour in driving accuracy with these ridiculous percentages. Some believe because he had the injury, it allowed him to create a swing path that returned the club square more consistently than others. Either way, as I said, these numbers over that length of time have not been seen before or after. And mind you, he did this with persimmon woods and balada golf balls. Developing his own way to play, I believe also helped give him that confidence and self-assurance 
which led to his unprecedented success as a black golfer. The thing that I learned, which is what we teach our children also and what we learn is that golf is the greatest character builder or character destroyer game there is, okay? It either builds you or break you down. It built me because I realized that I had to go out and play within Calvin Pete's personality, not Jack Nicklaus, not Tom Watson or Arnold Palmer. I had to be Calvin Pete. While Calvin was not the original pioneer like Charlie Sifford, Pete Brown, Lee Elder, and many more, he was the first to show that black golfers can succeed bigly against the best. From 1982 to 1985, his prime years, Calvin was the winningest player on tour. And in the 1980s overall, he was third behind only Tom Kite and Tom Watson in wins. This is also not to mention Calvin's great character. He carried himself as a true gentleman and a man who gave back to his community. And he served as the perfect bridge from those original pioneers to Tiger Woods. Now certainly, there are more layers to the story, and I encourage you all to read about it online. Some of those articles are linked in the description below if you're interested. But at the end of the day though, and given it's Black History Month, I really wanted to shed more light on the positives that Calvin P brought to life and the game of golf. He had every reason not to succeed, but he proved that no matter who you are, where you came from, what your physical stature is, or your age, with hard work, you can succeed in life and in golf. As many have said, Calvin Pete's story is a true inspiration for all, and he's helped open the door for many to pick up the game. Anyways, hope y'all enjoyed the video. It was nice to look up old Calvin Pete in his classic Kangol hat. Definitely let me know your thoughts on Calvin Pete. Thanks again for watching y'all, and as always, please like, subscribe, and comment below. Your words mean something to me.